Chapter 1, The Mystery of the Godhead. Chapter 1 contains footnotes numbers 121 to 283. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgment of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Colossians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. The most necessary place to begin teaching on God's mysteries is with God himself, the author of life, creator of the universe, giver of every good and perfect gift, the only wise God. Colossians 1 verse 18 says, Christ should have preeminence or first place in all things, so he will be the first revealed mystery in this book. In the epigraph, Colossians chapter 2 verses 2 and 3 speaks of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. From henceforth I'll refer to this mystery as the Godhead rather than the lengthier description. Notice also from the epigraph that Paul wants Christians to acknowledge the mysterious aspect of the Godhead. This chapter acknowledges that Christians do not know everything about God as it clearly states the one final mystery that remains. While God is infinite and we are finite, we can know God's nature based upon his own word while rejecting Satan's lies about God because we have the discerning power of God's sword, his word. Scripture must unveil who God is and who God is not, for God has given us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. God manifests himself to believers through revelation or the spiritual unveiling of himself. Jesus told Peter that the Heavenly Father could reveal Jesus' identity to Peter through revelation only, saying, Flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Notice that Jesus' own flesh and blood, through his own human ability, could not reveal his identity to Peter. It took a revelation from the Heavenly Father for Peter to know that Jesus was the Christ. The same is true today. The Heavenly Father must reveal Jesus Christ to a person, or else he will not understand the Godhead. The Confusion About the Godhead The confusion about the Godhead centers on how many persons he is. Since nearly a third of the world's 7.3 billion people are professed Christians, it can be estimated that nearly 2 billion Christians are Trinitarians, believing God is three separate, distinct, co-equal persons. A small minority believe God is two persons, and even fewer say he is one person. The revelation of the mystery of the Godhead is God is one invisible person, three persons is essentially tritheism, who created the body of his son Jesus to be his one eternal image and tabernacle. The Trinitarian confusion is extremely vast and far-reaching because it started more than 1,800 years ago. And like the hidden leaven in Jesus' mystery parable, called the leaven hidden three measures of meal, see chapter 8, has had plenty of time to permeate into churches worldwide. Around 180 AD, Theophilus of Antioch first used the Greek form of the term trinity, trias, and shortly afterwards Tertullian coined the Latin form trinitas. The so-called three persons were declared as one God, at the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. and the Council of Constantinople in 381 A.D. God's hand-picked authors of the New Testament, Paul, Peter, James, and John, never used the term Trinity nor its definition of God in three persons. Ultimately, the Trinity dogma pridefully and erroneously exalts man's false interpretation above God's revelation given to the New Testament authors. There is absolutely no biblical proof for a trinity of three persons, so God should not be called such. Prayerfully consider that no doctor of divinity or seminary student can produce one scripture in the Bible that literally says God is three persons. Biblical Proof for the Revelation About the Godhead The Bible defines God as one invisible spirit who eternally exists as one person. Three verses say God is one, while seven scriptures say God is one God. God alone is Savior, and there is no other God or person beside Him. For He says, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. This one God manifests Himself in three ways to redeem mankind. 
Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Three persons automatically equates to tritheism, or else language has lost its meaning completely. Trinitarianism, then, is a false doctrine. The early church and Bible authors had the revelation that God is one person with three manifestations or offices. The apostles' collective revelation was one God with three titles, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. God chose His only begotten Son to be His one human image, the image of the invisible God, placing the fullness of the Godhead in the body of Jesus Christ. All of God was in Christ. Paul writes, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Thus, Jesus Christ is supreme deity. Jesus is God. Just listen to deity speaking in Jesus Christ. In John 8, verse 58, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. John 10, verse 30 says, I and my Father are one, not two persons. When Philip asked to see the Father, in John 14, verses 8 through 10, Jesus said, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. The late Rev. William Branham references Revelation 1, verses 4-8, through 8, saying, Just listen to these words again. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. This is deity. This is not simply a prophet, a man. This is God. And it is not a revelation of three gods, but of one God, the Almighty. Additionally, Branham says, But the revelation through John by the Spirit to the churches was, I am the Lord Jesus Christ, and I am all of it. There isn't any other God. Jesus was also fully human. Christ was a one-of-a-kind person unlike any man before or after, fully human and fully divine. Because Jesus' flesh was not divine, some interpret him as being a separate person from God. But 1 Timothy 3 verse 16 settles the question by saying, God was manifest in the flesh. A second person did not come, but God came in another form or manifestation. Hebrews 10 verse 20 calls Jesus' body God's veil. Jesus is the human form of God. He is God's human temple. Christ is the Father's image. Jesus is God's form, temple, image, and veil. Eight Problems with the Trinity Dogma There are eight glaring problems with the Trinity doctrine. First and most decimating to its validity, the Trinity dogma adds to the Bible. The term Trinity and its definition, God in three persons, are nowhere found in Scripture. God's Word unleashes great curses and consequences upon anyone who adds to the Bible. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6, commands us to not add to God's pure words, for those who do will be found as liars. Paul says those who pervert the gospel and change it are cursed. The New Testament closes by warning those who add or take away from God's book will have plagues added to their punishment or their name taken off the book of life. The term Trinity and its definition are blatantly absent from Scripture. The Trinity dogma is a house built upon sand, and great will be its fall on Judgment Day. The Trinity is not detailed in Scripture. The Catholic Encyclopedia states, In Scripture there is as yet no single term by which the three divine persons are denoted together. The Encyclopedia of Religion says theologians agree that both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament do not contain an explicit doctrine of the Trinity, and it is incontestable that the doctrine cannot be established on scriptural evidence alone. Millard Erickson declares the Trinity is not overtly or explicitly stated in Scripture, and must be understood by inferences while exercising systematic theology. Contrarywise, Jesus says he is known by revelation, not theology. Just as the masters in Israel could not grasp the spiritual principles of Jesus' doctrine in his day, Trinitarian theologians miss the spiritual revelation of the Godhead today. 
The specific words triune and trinity are not evil words of themselves. If used with correct biblical understanding, these words can be used to describe God's three manifestations. For example, God is triune or three in one, three manifestations in one God. But God is not three persons in one, or else language has completely lost all meaning. God is also a trinity of manifestations if trinity is defined as threefold, or the state of being three. The impure words, three persons, cannot be used to understand God because they change God's testimony of himself. My friend Holden summarized it well, saying, God in three persons is simply polytheism rebranded as the Holy Trinity. A brief study into ancient pagan religions shows numerous polytheistic religions worship a trinity-like group of deities or gods. Nearly 5,000 years ago, Sumerians worshipped a triad of deities, Anu, Enlil, and Ea. In the New Kingdom Egyptian Age, from 1539 to 1075 BC, worship was given to a triad of gods, Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Clearly, God in three persons was polytheism rebranded, especially considering the word trinity and its definition were not coined until nearly 150 years after Christ. Although Islam is a false religion, I agree with Muslims on the trinity, for they teach the Christian dogma of a trinitarian god is a form of tritheism, or a three-god belief. Second, Jesus and his apostles taught and affirmed pure Hebrew monotheism rather than Trinitarianism. Two texts show Jesus' affirmation of the Hebrew understanding of the Godhead, John 4 verses 19 through 26 and Mark 12 verses 28 through 34. In John 4 verse 22, Jesus spoke with the Samaritan woman and told her, We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. According to Christ, the Jews worship God in truth, and Judaism has always been the purest monotheism even from ancient times. Mark 12 records Jesus' conversation with the scribe about the greatest commandment, and Christ confirms that God is one, not three. Jesus quoted Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, the ancient Hebrew prayer known as the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Note that Jesus did not add to the Shema and say that God is three persons. Our Lord always pointed people back to the Jewish faith of pure monotheism. Jesus' apostles and early church leaders had no controversy about the subject of the Godhead in the first century. The New Testament, especially the book of Acts, gives us a record of the counsels and problems the apostles had, such as their command to Gentile Christians, to abstain from eating blood and fornication in Acts chapter 15. But there's no record of the apostles having a disagreement about the Godhead because they all held the Hebrew monotheistic understanding of God, like Jesus himself. The early apostles had the true baptism of the Holy Ghost, and all agreed on the Godhead. And today, all those who have the same baptism of the Holy Ghost will agree with and teach the Godhead the same way as Christ and his apostles. Third, the Athanasian Creed, or 6th century Trinitarian confessional, contains multiple contradictions to biblical teaching on the Godhead. Creeds always cause confusion because they are written by uninspired men who either add or take away from Scripture, immediately limiting the Holy One of Israel. Psalm 78 verse 41 reads, Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Notice the Athanasian Creed's six contradictions. The Creed says we worship one God in Trinity, but Jesus says we worship Him, God, the one person, not three persons, in spirit and in truth. Worship in the Spirit is walking in the Spirit by denying the sinful works of the flesh. Worshiping in truth is believing only the Bible testimony of the Godhead, which does not mention a three-person God. Jesus said, Thy word is truth, in John 17, verse 17, proving the Trinity cannot be truth, since it is absent from the word. The creed says, The Son uncreated, but the Bible says the flesh of Jesus was created, or made of a woman, in the womb of Mary, by the Holy Ghost. 
Also, Jesus calls himself the beginning of the creation of God. So how can the creed call him uncreated? Undoubtedly, though, the Father that dwelt in Christ and spake through Christ was uncreated, which is why Jesus said in John 8, verse 58, Before Abraham was, I am. The great uncreated I am dwelt in the body of Jesus of Nazareth. The creed says the Son unlimited, but the Bible says Jesus' human knowledge was limited, for he did not know the identity of the woman with the blood issue who touched him, nor did he know the day and hour of his second coming to earth. The creed says the Son is of the Father alone, but the Bible says Jesus' body was conceived of the Holy Ghost, not specifically naming the Father in the womb of Mary. The creed denies the Holy Ghost as the Father of Jesus, annulling Matthew 1, verse 20. If the creed is true, then Jesus seems to have two fathers, since the one who conceives a child is the Father. The truth is that the Bible reveals the Father and Holy Ghost as the selfsame person, not two separate persons. The creed says none is greater or less than another, but the Bible says Jesus declared in John 14, verse 28, the Father is greater than I. The truth is that the flesh of Jesus was mortal during his earthly ministry, but God the Father is a spirit and has always been and always will be immortal. The Creed says God is three persons, but the Bible never uses that language to describe God because he is one person. The Word teaches that the Father is the Holy Spirit, which decreases the Trinity's total down to only two persons, Father and Son. Then, the two will be decreased down to one, because Hebrews 1 verse 3 says the Son is the express image of the one person of God. As Colossians 1 verse 15 says, Christ is the image of the invisible God. Christ is not a second person, but the visible image of the person of God. Few Trinitarians are aware that the first part of the Athanasian Creed was visually summarized as the shield of the Trinity. See figure 1. This image creates unsound doctrine, contradicting itself. A contradiction is defined as a statement of a position opposite to one already made. Claiming the Holy Spirit is God, while also saying the Holy Spirit is not the Father, is a contradiction of opposite statements. Ephesians 4 verse 30 plainly states, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus prayed, Holy Father, in John 17, verse 11. The Father is the Holy Spirit, for there is only one Spirit. The implications of three persons in the Godhead are doctrinally dangerous, proven by two examples. First, if the Holy Ghost is not the Father, then Jesus had two fathers. Jesus prayed to the Heavenly Father, but his physical body must have been conceived by another father, the Holy Ghost, because Matthew 1, verse 20 says, that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Two fathers equals two persons, which equals two gods. Second, if the Holy Ghost and Father are separate persons, then Jesus had two persons living inside himself, the third person. Jesus said the Father dwelt in him in John 14, verse 10. Then John 1, verse 32 says the Holy Spirit abode or dwelt in Christ. Nowhere does the Bible tell us to believe that two eternal persons dwell in a third eternal person. That would make three eternals or three gods. The truth is that the Father and Holy Ghost are the self-same person. The Father came and lived in the temple or body of his son, Jesus. The Father came and hid behind the veil of Jesus' flesh. Jesus was not a second person, but the image of God's one person, the Word made flesh. Thus, Three personalities equal three separate person gods, or else the English language has lost its meaning entirely. Three persons in the Godhead equals three gods or tritheism. It's simply polytheism. This means Trinitarianism is idolatry, which breaks the first commandment. Fourth, major Bible contradictions and inconsistencies exist among Trinitarians. Most dangerous are those who lean more towards tritheism, the belief in three separate gods. For example, in his seminary thesis, one pastor wrote that God exists in three equal beings and is three distinct beings. 
These phrases match the very definition of tritheism. Even though pastors who believe this often try to protect themselves by saying, yet God is one, they are nevertheless contradicting scripture and propagating polytheism. A great inconsistency among Trinitarians is those who claim to worship sola scriptura, Latin for by scripture alone, but then admit to understanding the Godhead using pagan ideology. For example, a prominent evangelical Trinitarian scholar wrote that Trinitarians tend to alternate between tritheism, a belief in three equal, closely related gods, and modalism, a belief in one god who plays three different roles or reveals himself in three different fashions. How incredibly deceptive and sad when Bible teachers admit to accepting pagan ideas into Christianity. Christians who claim to worship by Scripture alone should only worship by Scripture, never rotating between an heir and Scripture. Can you imagine the evil of rotating between the sanctity of life, pro-life, and abortion, thinking that sometimes it is acceptable to kill a baby in the womb? It is foolish to rotate between good and evil. These Trinitarians who rotate between tritheism and modalism are at best spiritual children in understanding, being tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men. Fifth, the early Trinitarians did not affirm that the Holy Spirit was divine until the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD. This further proves that the Bible writers only, not the originators of the Trinity, had revelation on the Godhead, because Luke, the author of Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, used the words Holy Spirit and God interchangeably. Peter states that Ananias lied to the Holy Ghost in verse 3, and then in the next verse, Luke said Ananias lied to God. The early epistles and Bible authors instantly knew the Holy Spirit was God in 30 AD, whereas the misguided Trinitarians did not agree to this until about 350 years later. Sixth, Trinitarian images and artwork are often deceptive, creating false representations of the Godhead. Some images portray a heavenly scene containing two men sitting on two thrones, an old man representing the Father, and a young man as Christ. In the air between them is a white dove symbolizing the Holy Spirit. These images are not scriptural, for no Bible text ever describes two thrones for two people in heaven, and there are no references to a dove flying around two men in heaven. These untrue images create a false security in Trinitarians' minds as some sort of visual evidence for their extra-biblical beliefs. As Christians, we must use discernment in the art we accept, for Paul says, We ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. When you get to heaven, and later when heaven comes down to earth, you will not see two persons and a dove, but you'll see one person, Jesus Christ, ruling from only one throne. This is because no one has seen, can see, nor ever will see the Father, for he is invisible. The book of Revelation says you will see Jesus' body only, for he is the image of the invisible God who suddenly appears among the eternal colors around the one throne. Christ's human body with a countenance shining as the sun is God's only image we will see, not a dove nor a wrinkly old man. Seventh, some Trinitarians use two fear tactics to persuade others to believe in the Trinity, heresy and hell. First, labeling non-Trinitarians as heretics is a serious accusation, as the Greek meaning is a body of men following their own tenets. Heretics, ultimately filled with the pride of life, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Additionally, heresies show who God has rejected, and Christians are commanded to avoid heretics. A second fear tactic is repeating an anonymous saying, Try to explain it, Trinity, and you'll lose your mind, but try to deny it, and you'll lose your soul. In other words, if you do not believe in the Trinity, you will go to hell. Nothing could be further from the truth. Your eternal destiny is not based upon your acceptance or rejection of the man-made Trinity dogma. Fear should never motivate blind faith in any doctrine. Instead, Christ's perfect love casts out all fear. As you faithfully love God, who is the Word, 
Over time, all your fears about your salvation will leave your mind because God promises to develop a divine, lively hope in your heart. Furthermore, Bible-believing Christians do not deny anything the Bible teaches about the Father, the Son, or the Holy Ghost. Rather, believers rejoice in the revelation of the Godhead and simply deny the false teaching. The false statements surrounding the Trinity doctrine essentially allow polytheism in the church or the worship of more than one God, although it is not officially stated in that manner. God will not send anyone to hell because they rejected the Trinity doctrine and its additions to Holy Writ. Surely God will do the opposite. He'll save those who believe only the Bible's revelation and eternal truths of the Godhead. Eighth, God sent a prophet named William Branham, see chapters 7 and 13, to warn Christians about the false Trinity doctrine. In 1961, Branham declared, Trinitarianism is of the devil. I say that, thus saith the Lord. While Branham believed Trinitarians could still be genuine Christians, he said they were sincerely wrong about the Trinity. Recall some prophets God sent to warn his people, Noah to his generation, Jonah to Nineveh, and John the Baptist to the Pharisees. Likewise, God's faithful heart has sent his prophet William Branham to this time period, to warn his people of the Trinitarian deception in the name of the Lord and its sinful addition to the faith. This prophet taught Christians to understand God using Bible terminology only. God manifests himself in three ways. In his redemption of man, the one God manifests himself in three ways, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Manifest, meaning show or appear in the Greek, is the key word to understanding the Godhead. The word manifest is specific Bible terminology used 11 times in connection to Jesus. A synonym for manifest is form in the King James Bible. Paul uses form to describe God's manifestation in Christ in Philippians 2 verse 6 saying, Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. The Greek lexicon states form means the form by which a person or thing strikes the vision, external appearance. As God the Father, he appeared in many forms to Israel. To redeem man by the cross, God took only one form, the man Jesus Christ. To fill believers' souls on the day of Pentecost, he took the form of the Holy Spirit, one God changing his form, not three persons. God's one person his person, is made up of three manifestations, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Man is the same. He is one person made up of three aspects, body, spirit, and soul. Paul says, I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Since man is created in the image of God, after God's own image, God cannot be three persons in one person, because man is not three persons in one person. To make God into three persons is to break God's image he described in Genesis. Three manifestations or forms do not equal three persons, especially when you consider God the Father's many manifestations, which include the human priest Melchizedek, a pillar of fire, a burning bush, a rock in the wilderness, and a voice in the whirlwind. To understand God, you must use God's vocabulary words, manifest or form, rather than adding man-made words like three persons. The three manifestations or appearances of God, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, are the same person in a different form. God above us, God with us, God in us. First, God manifested himself as a father when he created male and female in Genesis chapter 1. Malachi 2 verse 10 says, Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? The Father is above us in heaven. God so powerfully, magnificently, and obviously manifests his creative work inside each and every human body that all men will be without excuse on the day of judgment, for they witness and experience God's power in their own bodies. In other words, no man will be able to deny God's fatherhood on the day of judgment. Second, God was manifest in flesh in the human body of Christ in order to redeem and reconcile his people back to himself through the blood of Jesus' cross. 
In his invisible spirit form, God could not redeem his sinful people because remission of sins came only by shed blood, according to his own law. Invisible spirit God had to condescend into a flesh body that he himself prepared for a once-for-all sin sacrifice. God named that body Emmanuel, or God with us, and then came and dwelt in Jesus' body. For Jesus said the Father dwelt in him. Jesus was not a second person of God, but was and is the visible image of the invisible God. Third, the Holy Ghost is the Father Spirit manifest in the lives of humans on earth. Chapter 6 labors on this subject. In the Old Testament, the Holy Ghost was a strong but temporary anointing on the believer's flesh and mind. A soul like Abraham's could have a small anointing on his soul, but the soul wasn't filled with God's Spirit. For Christians, the Holy Ghost is God in us, abiding fully in our souls as a seal, described by Jesus as the baptism of the Holy Ghost. This baptism came after Jesus ascended to heaven when the eternal spirit that was in him divided itself and came to live in the Christians on the day of Pentecost. This same Holy Spirit has been dwelling in the souls of true Christians ever since. The Holy Ghost is God manifest in believers. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 7 declares, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. It's essential to recognize that the Holy Ghost is the Father because God is holy and God is a Spirit. The Holy Ghost is literally God the Father, not a third person in a trinity. The Bible never says that there are two different Holy Spirits, so the Holy Spirit is God the Father himself. Consider the multiple scriptures that prove the Holy Ghost and Father are the same person. First, the body of Jesus was conceived of the Holy Ghost, proving the Holy Ghost is the Father of Jesus. Since Jesus cannot have two fathers, the Bible-based conclusion is that the Father and Holy Ghost are the self-same person. Second, Jesus said the Father dwelt in him, but the Bible also records that the Holy Ghost abode upon him and anointed him. Jesus did not have two separate persons anointing him, but God's one Spirit. Third, God the Father promised to pour out his own spirit, not a third person's spirit, on the day of Pentecost, according to Joel 2, verses 27 through 29, saying, I am the Lord your God. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. God's own spirit is not a separate person outside himself. The sending of the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2 was simply God the Father pouring out his spirit into the souls of believers, not a third person coming but the spirit of the one and only living God being shared with humanity. Jesus named the spirits coming at Pentecost as the promise of my Father. Paul proved the Holy Ghost was the Father when he wrote, God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will receive you and will be a Father unto you. Modalism and the Oneness Movement Bible scholars label the true Godhead teaching God in three manifestations, as modalism. Although modalism is closer to the truth than Trinitarianism, Christians should not accept the modalist label because it contradicts scripture at times. Modalistic monarchianism, which emerged during the 2nd century and eventually became labeled as heresy in the 4th century, is defined as the doctrine that the persons of the Trinity represent only three modes or aspects of the divine revelation, not distinct and co-equal persons in the divine nature. This definition fully agrees with Scripture. Digging deeper, though, Erickson says modalism teaches the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are identical. They are successive revelations of the same person who has three different names, roles, or activities. This is where modalism breaks down in two ways. First, while the Father and Holy Spirit are identical, the Father and Son are not fully identical. The Father and Son share the identical nature, as God is His Word, and His Word became flesh in Christ, but their substance is different. Father substance is an invisible, eternal spirit, but the Son had a human substance. Second, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost have one name, not three. Matthew 28, verse 19 says there is one name, not names, for the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 
Scripture verifies this as Jesus declared he came in his Father's name in John 5, verse 43. So the name of the Father is Jesus, since its Greek meaning is Jehovah is salvation. The name of the Son is Jesus, for the angel of the Lord told Joseph to name the Son Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Finally, Jesus said the Holy Ghost would come in his name, saying, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. Acts 4 verse 12 says, There is salvation in no other name. Just as Zechariah 14 verse 9 says, There is one Lord and his name one. God has one name, the Lord Jesus Christ. A third way modalism fails is its claim that the Father suffered along with Christ, since he was actually present in and personally identical with the Son. First, the Father cannot suffer physically since spirits do not have flesh and bones. Second, the Father forsook Jesus as Christ died on Calvary. Jesus cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The Holy Spirit anointing inside of him, or the Father's Spirit, left Jesus somewhere between the Garden of Gethsemane and the cross. The Father had to leave Jesus' body because Christ was made a curse for us, and God hath made him to be a sin for us. The Father could not curse himself to redeem mankind, so he created a human form of himself in order to pay sin's ransom. Born-again Christians do not need labels for their beliefs, especially regarding the Godhead. The book of Acts is absent of believers debating about the number of persons God is. Early apostles were men full of faith and never called themselves Trinitarians or modalists. Peter, James, John, and Paul didn't need creeds or fancy labels. Their only need was to know Christ, for once they knew Christ, who is the Word, He would lead and guide them into all truth. There is an increasingly popular religious label called oneness, which correctly rejects the Trinity and believes God is one person, but one does not need to attach labels to God's revelation. Additionally, some oneness interpretations are false. The largest organization in the oneness movement is the United Pentecostal Church International, which represents nearly 5 million believers worldwide. While I rejoice that oneness Pentecostals have received much truth, their major error is emphasizing speaking in tongues as the evidence for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The erroneous and unbalanced evidence places excessive emphasis on a gift of the Holy Ghost rather than the Holy Ghost himself. Jesus reveals the true evidence of the Holy Ghost in John 16 verse 13, being guided into all truth. The evidence of the Holy Ghost is taught in chapter 6. Reducing persons leaves the mystery of plural nouns. Based upon this overwhelming biblical evidence, it is easiest to reduce the Trinitarian false doctrine of three persons down to two persons by starting with God the Father and the Holy Ghost. If you can see that God the Father is the selfsame person as the Holy Ghost, since Jesus did not have two fathers, the three persons instantly reduces down to two. While two persons are closer to the truth than three, believers are faced with the fact that God never said, I am two persons. So the only solution must be that God is one person. This brings us to the one and only mystery remaining about the Godhead. Jesus' usage of first-person plural pronouns like we and us when referring to the Father is the only remaining Godhead mystery. In John 14, verse 23, Jesus says, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Jesus uses we, a plural pronoun, and our, a possessive determiner, to speak of his and the Father's coming to dwell in the man who keeps his words. Then in John 17, verse 21, Jesus uses us to refer to himself and the Father, saying, That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. If God is not two or three persons, why does Jesus use plural pronouns and possessive determiners? The best biblical answer is that Jesus was both fully human and fully divine, yet his human side was not divine. Therefore, Jesus had to use a separate pronoun for himself, since he was mortal, unlike the immortal Father. Jesus experienced temptation in his human will, but the Father cannot be tempted. Jesus died, 
but the Father can never die. Jesus is a human, but the Father is an eternal spirit. Consequently, a separate pronoun was needed for Jesus, yet he was not a co-equal distinct person from the Father. He was the express image of the Father. Consider that Jesus is a unique, one-of-a-kind human manifestation, completely unlike God's previous manifestations, Melchizedek, a pillar of fire, a burning bush, a rock in the wilderness, and a voice in the whirlwind. Jesus was born of a woman, Mary, unlike Melchizedek, who had no father or mother. The truth about God's need to use plural nouns lies somewhere between the two extremes of father and son beliefs, two co-equal persons, and total oneness. The truth is always in the middle of the road. Two co-equal, eternal, separate, distinct persons is essentially polytheism, and Jesus' own words reveal his father is greater than he, for my father is greater than I. On the other end of the spectrum, total oneness isn't biblical, because Jesus was not his own father. In other words, the body of Jesus did not create itself. The Holy Ghost, who is the eternal spirit father, created Jesus' body in Mary's womb. I've often heard the true statement, God is not one like your finger. God and Christ are one, but only in a scriptural way. The Father and Son are one by their sinless nature. The Father is an invisible spirit, and the Son is the human temple of the Father. Using plural nouns shows the difference between Jesus' flesh body and his immortal invisible spirit. God could not die as an eternal, immortal, invisible, omnipotent being. So he created a son that could die. Jesus' flesh was made to be sin for us, or was made a curse for us, as a substitutionary sacrifice for mankind. But God's eternal spirit could not curse itself. Jesus was completely human, and his flesh had its own will it had to wrestle with in prayer against every temptation. But God's will can never be tempted by evil. While there were great differences between Jesus' flesh body and God's spirit, there was one major similarity between the two. Jesus' nature, or character, was exactly the same as the Father's. Hebrews 1 verse 3 says Christ is the express image, or exact expression, precise reproduction of God, according to the Greek lexicon. When the Holy Ghost foreshadowed Mary's womb and created Jesus' body, all of God's character was in his Son. Throughout Jesus' earthly life, he never sinned. The tendency of his flesh was to always rely upon the Father's word, always obeying God, always acting like God would act, for he was God's human image. Furthermore, plural nouns were necessary because Jesus' body was a unique, one-of-a-kind manifestation and creation. Jesus of Nazareth was unlike any other human being in history. God will never make another human body to be his image, for Christ is his only begotten Son, as declared six times in Scripture. Also, God knew he'd be using his Son's physical body throughout all eternity, which is why Jesus said, We will come unto him and make our abode with him. By using we and our, God is revealing that Christians need both the Father and Son manifestations throughout eternity as they are indispensable. The Son's physical body reveals the invisible Father, for the Father could not be seen without the Son. This conclusion about plural nouns is both scriptural and so much more safer, reverent, and ultimately pleasing to God compared to the sin of adding uninspired words to God's eternal, inspired, inerrant word. Proverbs 30 verses 5 and 6 says, Adding to God's word carries the accusation of being reproved as a liar by God himself. Rest in the truth that God is not the author of confusion. He is not trying to confuse us by using plural nouns. Rather, he's helping us see the necessity of his manifestation in flesh, the body of Jesus Christ. Through his son's body, God could be seen, held, and handled. For John says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. 
If God is one person and not three, how should a Christian understand scriptures like Genesis 1 verse 26, Matthew 28 verse 19, and 1 John 5 verse 7 that reference the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost by using God's provided words? Understanding Genesis 1 verse 26 Trinitarians often cite Genesis 1 verse 26 as proof of multiple persons in the Godhead based upon the plural pronoun us, for God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. This does not prove multiple persons in the Godhead. Again, Trinitarians are adding to the word, since Genesis 1 verse 26 does not say, let three persons, us, make man in our image. Before guessing about the meaning of let us, it's essential to examine make in the verse, for there is only one maker, not two and not three. Malachi 2 verse 10 says we have one Father, one God created us. There are not two creators, only one. Isaiah 44 verse 24 plainly states, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. The Lord alone forms humans in the womb. He alone stretched out the heavens. The Lord did all this by himself, not with two other persons. There are two possible explanations for the usage of us in Genesis 1, verse 26. First, God is referring to himself and the angelic host, because the Lord used us in this manner in two other passages, Genesis 11, verse 7, and Isaiah 6, verse 8. In Genesis 11, verses 6 through 9, the Lord, or Jehovah, says, Let us go down and there confound their language. And verses 8 and 9 record the Lord only scattering the men at Babel. It's likely God came with his angels to scatter and confound the men, just as God and two angels came down to earth to visit Abraham and Lot in Genesis chapters 18 and 19. Contrarywise, it's impossible that a three-person God visited Babel, since the Bible never describes God as three people. Isaiah 8, verses 1 through 8, describes Isaiah's heavenly vision in which he sees heavenly beings called seraphims. But then Isaiah sees only one person, not three, sitting on heaven's throne, the Lord, Yahweh. God was spiritually cleansing Isaiah in order to send him to his people, saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Notice God's use of us, as it seems to refer to God and the seraphims. Isaiah's preaching ministry was a necessary warning from God and his angels to Israel before the backslidden nation was carried out of the promised land. The second possibility is that let us, in Genesis 1 verse 26, refers to the combined work of the Father and Son, and yet this would not equate to two individual persons. This would coincide with Jesus' usage of us in reference to the Father in John 17, verse 21. In the beginning, let us means the invisible Father used his word, later acknowledged as Christ in John 1, verses 1 through 3, to create man. Just as you use your spoken words to create your daily activities, the invisible God used his words to create man and all things. Ephesians 3 verse 9 supports this, saying, God created all things by Jesus Christ. God created by his word. He created by speaking. Are your words separate persons from you? No, they are your thoughts expressed. In the same way, Jesus was God's thought expressed, not a second person. Later, God's word became a man, and it was necessary for mankind's redemption for him to have attributes different from the Father such as mortality and humanity, but that did not make him a second person. It only made Christ the visible image of God's invisible person. Additionally, the Father and Son shared one image, not two, in Genesis 1 verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. This shows God's tendency to use a plural pronoun for his manifestations while having one image, since you already know God is invisible and Christ is God's one image. 
In Genesis chapter 1, God's two manifestations shared one image, which was a celestial body. A celestial body is a spirit body, like an angelic body, and is invisible to the human eye under normal circumstances. The Father and Son shared a celestial body, and each angel had their own separate celestial body. When God created man in Genesis chapter 1, man was in a spirit body, not a flesh body, for that was God's image at that time. It wasn't until Genesis 2 verse 7 when God put man's spirit, which had both masculine and feminine parts, in a body of flesh. Understanding Matthew 28 verse 19 and water baptism. In Matthew 28 verse 19, Jesus says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. While this verse is probably the most commonly used proof of the Trinity, close examination of it actually reveals God's one name and three titles. The first revelation in this scripture is that there is one name, not three names, for the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost that is to be called upon at a believer's baptism. Jesus did not say to baptize in the names. He said name singular. Since God is one person, Jesus commanded God's followers to be baptized in one name, which the book of Acts interprets as the Lord Jesus Christ. Ten days after Jesus said to baptize in the one name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, Peter commanded thousands to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Since Peter was freshly filled with the Holy Ghost, he would not have contradicted Jesus' commandment about baptism. Rather, Peter had the revelation that there is one name for the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the Lord Jesus Christ. Later in Acts, you'll find that Philip and Paul also baptized believers the same way Peter did, in the name of the Lord Jesus, demonstrating unity among the Holy Ghost-filled preachers regarding the one name believers are to be baptized into. You can search the entire New Testament and you will never find one baptism recorded using the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Biblical and historical records validate that Jesus' apostles used the Lord Jesus Christ baptism, which is referred to as the apostolic baptism, beginning on the day of Pentecost around 30 AD to at least 100 AD when Christians were recorded as being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus in Rome. In other words, the only baptismal formula used by Jesus' apostles was the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Non-biblical records pinpoint 100 AD as the general time period the false Trinitarian baptism or liturgical baptism was wrongly injected into Christian circles to replace the true water baptism in Jesus Christ's name. The Interpreter's Bible states that the early apostolic church had no trace of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost liturgical baptism and that it is not to be taken as part of Jesus' original commission but comes from later liturgical use. The Encyclopedia Britannica states the Trinitarian formula and triune immersion were not uniformly used from the beginning. The New Standard Encyclopedia states, at first, only adults were baptized, generally by immersion and in Christ's name only. By the second century, baptism in the name of the Holy Trinity and soon the practice of infant baptism was introduced. The Encyclopedia of Early Christianity records the Father, Son, Holy Ghost baptismal phrase is frequently attested in the second century as a formula accompanying baptism. The Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible says the evidence from the book of Acts suggests that baptism in early Christianity was administered not in the threefold name, but in the name of Jesus Christ or in the name of the Lord Jesus. Be rebaptized if you were baptized incorrectly in the liturgical formula. According to the book of Acts in history, Correct baptism is the preacher pronouncing aloud your baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and not the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You need not be ashamed if you need to be rebaptized, as rebaptism is scriptural. In Acts 19 verses 1 through 6, 
Ephesian believers learned from Paul that the water baptism required to be filled with the Holy Ghost was to be performed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Ephesians had previously been baptized through John the Baptist's method of water baptism, which purpose was only repentance or justification. But upon hearing Paul's preaching, they were rebaptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and then filled with the Holy Ghost. When I learned this in 2002, I was rebaptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because I wanted not only repentance, but the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I hope you'll have the literal name of the Lord Jesus Christ pronounced over you at your baptism or rebaptism. Some Trinitarians say that believers should use the Father, Son, Holy Ghost baptismal formula of Matthew 28 verse 19 rather than the Lord Jesus Christ formula because Jesus' words have more weight than the apostles. Although Jesus' words are infallible, their reasoning fails for three reasons. First, the apostles were filled with Jesus' spirit, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, when they commanded new converts to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said his spirit would lead believers into all truth, and that is exactly what happened. The Holy Spirit taught the apostles that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is the one name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Second, this illogical Trinitarian argument pits Jesus against his apostles as if they were enemies. How sad to purposely create division among Jesus and his apostles just to scare people into accepting a creed-based baptism over the one true water baptism. The truth is that Jesus and the apostles were in one accord because they all had the baptism of the Holy Ghost, bringing them into the unity of the Spirit. Third, denying and ignoring the five Book of Acts baptism examples would be taken away from the Word of God, which carries severe repercussions. God's one name is a revelation that was kept secret for 4,000 years until God unveiled it through His Son. As far back as Eden, God prophesied of the serpent-bruising Messiah, and 3,000 years after Eden, King Agur inquired of Christ's name, asking, What is his name, and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? Messiah's name remained hidden because part of the prophecy related to Jesus' mission was to speak in parables, fulfilled in Matthew 13, and utter dark sayings or enigmas, as the Hebrew lexicon states. Christ's words about the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in Matthew 28, verse 19, were a fulfillment of the dark sayings prophecy. God had never spoken of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in the Old Testament, making Jesus' words in Matthew 28, verse 19, an enigma, or concept difficult to understand for the carnal mind. But Jesus opened his disciples' understanding regarding repentance and baptism before his ascension, that they might know God's one name. Matthew 28, verse 19 is still an enigma to many millions of churchgoers. Thankfully, through the foretold restoration of the last days, God has revealed the enigma of his Son's name, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the name above all names. Many titles, but one name. The three words, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, are titles, not names. God has many, many titles, but just one name. Indeed, I hold at least eight titles. Father, Son, Brother, Husband, Uncle, Pastor, Teacher, Friend. But I am not eight separate persons. If you apply the false Trinitarian logic of God being three persons because of the three titles in Matthew 28, verse 19, then Satan would be four persons because he is called Great Dragon, Old Serpent, Devil, and Satan in Revelation 12, verse 9. As Satan is not four persons, God is not three persons. God is one person who manifests himself in three ways to redeem mankind. Our Savior has numerous beautiful and meaningful titles, yet he is one person. In the Old Testament, he is called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the Righteous Branch, the Desire of All Nations, King, Messiah the Prince, Redeemer, the Headstone of the Corner, and Son of Righteousness, to name a few. Likewise, in the New Testament, he is called Rock, Root and Offspring of David, Bright and Morning Star, Resurrection and the Life, 
true vine, true light, the word of God, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and the first and last. As the four beasts repeatedly cry in the temple, Jesus is Lord God Almighty. What a glorious list of Jesus' titles. Yet these titles are not his one name, which is above every name, which is Jesus Christ. This is proven by the fact that demons were cast out only using the literal name of Jesus Christ, not his titles. Believers were baptized only using the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, not the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Miracles were done only using the name of Jesus Christ, not the righteous brand, for instance. It is necessary to recognize that the literal name of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the name above all names. Once recognized, it can be used powerfully and reverently as God desires. Power in the Name of Jesus Once I recognized God's name, the Lord Jesus Christ, it became a source of power to accomplish His will in my life and ministry. First, when I became a Christian before my preaching ministry, I felt God's forgiveness when I was baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I had been baptized twice before, once in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and once in Jesus' name only, but never felt forgiven. Faith in God's true name allowed me to experience His saving grace when I was buried in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, I experienced freedom from numerous addictions through Jesus Christ's literal name as I would speak his name out loud against tobacco, pornography, idolatry, and more. Before recognizing God's name, the Lord Jesus Christ, I was a helpless slave to sin. When my preaching ministry began, I spoke the name of Jesus Christ through his leading and watched his power cast out devils, heal the sick, bring deliverance to the addicted, bring forth babies for the barren, and more. While it may not be impossible, I have not yet witnessed any miracle or movement of God's Spirit by speaking aloud any of God's titles, such as Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Prince of Peace, or Righteous Branch. When I started speaking in God's literal name, I began seeing the power and authority that accompanies it. The entire Bible teaches that God's name has power, and believers experience it when they have faith in His name, according to Acts 3, verse 16. And His name, through faith in His name, hath made this man strong. When David defeated Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, verse 45, he said he came against the giant in the name of the Lord of hosts. Having faith in the Lord's name was the source of power and accuracy in David's stone and sling. John 1, verse 12 teaches those that receive Christ receive His power because they believe in His name. Acts 4, verse 7 emphatically declares a name is synonymous with power, for it says, By what power or by what name have you done this? In this instance, Peter was being questioned how the previously lame man had received perfect soundness of health and the ability to walk. In verse 10, Peter's answer was, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. The authority or power in Jesus Christ's name made the lame man whole. Humans can relate to the concept of a name representing power since human names carry reputations and have authority. Proverbs 22 verse 1 says, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Your actions have a powerful influence on others, which create your good name or reputation. Your name's authority is displayed when you purchase something with your credit card or with a check, because the transaction isn't complete until you've applied your signature to the receipt or check. If I sign my checks using my titles Father, Son, and Brother, my check will not be honored because they require the authority of my literal name. Another example is the name on a power of attorney document. Banks and businesses will honor only the one name that is certified and notarized as being a power of attorney. No other titles or names have power. In the same way, God's literal name, the Lord Jesus Christ, the name which is above every name, is the only name that carries authority or power when spoken in faith. 
Paul declares that Christ's power or name would be denied in the last days by egotistical, self-absorbed imposters of Christianity who have a form of godliness but not true godliness. Are Christian churches teaching their members to cast out devils in the name of Jesus Christ as Paul did in Acts 16 verse 18 or are they denying that power? Turn away from any church that denies this power. Very few churches teach the reality of the power in Jesus' name. This fulfills direct prophecy about the intent of the beast or Antichrist spirit in Revelation 13 verses 5 and 6 as Satan blasphemes God's name, tabernacle, and the saints in heaven. Blaspheme means to slander or detract in the Greek, meaning Satan reduces and takes away the value or worth of God's name. The popularity of the Trinity has valued and exalted the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost far above the name of Jesus Christ, thereby blaspheming God's true name, much to the enemy's delight. Few Christians are baptized in Jesus Christ's name. Even fewer perform miracles and cast out devils in Jesus Christ's name. Instead, they are taught to bless themselves using the sign of the cross in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And yet scripture says blessing oneself is a sign that a heart is turned away from serving God. Understanding 1 John 5 verse 7. 1 John 5 verse 7 reads, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Does this prove God is three persons? No, for it never says God is three persons, but rather gives extra support that God is one person, for it says these three are one, not three. What 1 John 5 verse 7 does offer is more proof that God has three manifestations he uses to redeem mankind, just as Matthew 28 verse 19 lists these three forms, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. As evidence that Son is a title and not a name, the scripture calls the Son the Word, which is a suitable alias for the same manifestation, for the Son is the Word made flesh. The Gospel of John and Book of Revelation both teach this, saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. This little-known truth of God's three manifestations bearing record in heaven requires attention. God will use his three manifestations— Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, to serve as multiple witnesses in heaven, either for or against all mankind. No matter which time period men lived in, before Christ's earthly ministry, during or after, there will be a heavenly record of how they treated God's word. The three bearing record in heaven cannot mean there are three persons sitting on judgment thrones in heaven, for scripture never states there are three heavenly thrones, or even two for that matter. There is only one throne. The Father is the heavenly witness either in favor of or against all men who lived before Jesus Christ walked the earth. The loving Father will witness that he sent men anointed of his spirit to preach, warn, and lead the people. Enoch preached the Father's warning, for Jude says he prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Moses also served as the father's witness when he reminded Israel of their covenant with Jehovah, saying, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. About 400 years before Christ, God the Father spoke through the prophet Malachi, telling Israel how he was a witness that the men had dealt treacherously with their wives, and he was no longer going to receive their offerings or tears. This scripture illuminates the fact that the Father's eyes plainly see into our homes, and that nothing is hid from the Lord. 
Jesus the Son is a heavenly witness because both his works and words will bear record of his ministry. Concerning his works, Christ says, The works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me, that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Jesus' preaching will have an equally weighty heavenly witness on Judgment Day. For he says, The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Jesus shockingly declared that the generation that rejected his earthly preaching would have two witnesses rise up against them in condemnation on the Day of Judgment, the men of Nineveh and the Queen of the South. The Ninevites' repentance proves heaven is recording which people truly change their hearts and lives after hearing gospel preaching. Heaven also records the lengths people will go to hear God's preaching, as the Queen of the South's testimony validates. The Holy Ghost bears record on all mankind now because Jesus' body currently sits at the right hand of the Majesty on high. Acts chapter 5, verses 31 and 32 teaches that the Holy Ghost currently gives witness to Jesus' death, resurrection, and exaltation. This witness is that the obedient Christian is born again or given the Holy Ghost as a gift from God. The miracle-producing presence of the Holy Ghost in the ministries of genuine Christians is also God's witness to all generations, as taught in Hebrews 2, verses 1-4. through 4. It's immensely important to recognize the witness of the Holy Ghost today, for Jesus said speaking against it will not be forgiven in this world, neither in the world to come. When 1 John 5, verse 7 is closely examined, it's clear that John was not listing three persons, but rather God's three manifestations that serve as heavenly witnesses for the actions of all humanity. Understanding Jesus' Baptism Does Jesus' water baptism at the Jordan River prove God is three persons? No, for if it did, that would prove Christianity is tritheism the belief in three distinct gods. To put it simply, Jesus' baptism shows God's power to manifest himself simultaneously in multiple ways, an attribute he previously displayed in the Old Testament. At the burning bush in Exodus 3, verses 1 through 6, Moses witnessed God manifest himself in two supernatural ways, by voice and fire. Some might see two persons here, Father as the voice and Holy Ghost as the fire. Recall that the Holy Ghost appeared as 120 licks of fire in Acts chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. But that does not mean he is 120 separate persons. Nothing in the Exodus text speaks of multiple personalities. The voice and fire were not showing God was two separate persons, but revealed his power to appear in different forms simultaneously. Paul says God's invisible spirit hides inside the light of the fire, in 1 Timothy 6, verse 16, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. When Jesus was baptized, many erroneously see three persons, Father as the voice, Son in the water, and Holy Ghost as the dove. The true understanding is that God spoke from heaven while his own spirit, not a third person, descended like a dove upon the man, Christ Jesus. God's three manifestations at Jesus' baptism do not prove three persons, just as the 120 licks of fire on the day of Pentecost do not prove the Holy Spirit is 120 separate persons. When understood correctly, Jesus' baptism shows one invisible person anointing his visible human image. Since God the Father is the Holy Ghost, Jesus' baptism shows one invisible person coming to inhabit the body or temple he created. Imagine a hand filling a glove. Once inside the glove, the hand does not become a second distinct hand, rather it's the same hand veiled behind an image. Like a glove, Jesus' body is the image God's person dwells within. Jesus is not a second person, but the single visual representation of God. Consider the three errors of Trinitarian logic regarding Jesus' baptism. First, it's an error to believe the co-equal Son was anointed by the co-equal Holy Spirit. You're probably aware the Bible says Jesus was anointed of the Holy Ghost in Acts 10, verse 38, 
So why does Trinitarianism teach the Son needs a third person to anoint him if he is already fully eternal God? A fully divine person should not need to be anointed by another fully divine person. Here we see how Trinitarianism leads to tritheism, since one God needs anointed by another God. The truth is that Jesus' human body was powerless on its own, proven by Jesus' own words in John 5, verse 19. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Jesus gave the Father credit for his miracles. As John 14, verse 10 says, The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Christ needed to be filled with the Holy Ghost and receive that filling at his River Jordan baptism. Prior to Jesus' resurrection, his human body was not immortal. It was mortal, didn't know all things, and died. Second, Trinitarianism has another problem related to the first. Supposedly, Jesus was filled with the third person of the Trinity at his baptism, but the doctrine doesn't explain when Jesus was filled with the first person, the Father. Jesus plainly said the Father dwelt in him in John 14, verse 10. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. How could God the Father be pleased with his Son at his baptism, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, when he was not dwelling in Jesus? God the Father said he would put his own spirit, not another person's spirit, in his Son, in Isaiah 42, verse 1, saying, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him. Third, Trinitarianism implies Jesus had two separate, distinct persons living inside him, despite the Bible never saying two persons dwell in him. Scripture says both the Father, John 14, verse 10, and Holy Ghost, Luke 4, verse 1, dwell in Jesus' body. If the Trinity is true, then two separate, distinct persons dwell in one person. But the truth is that the Father and Holy Ghost are the self-same person. Jesus did not suffer with DID, the multiple personalities disorder. Truly, Jesus' baptism shows the one person, the Father Spirit, coming to fill and lead his human image, his Son. Fourth, some believe the Holy Ghost that descended like a dove upon Jesus' body exists eternally as a visible dove. The book of Revelation, along with the rest of the Bible, never mentions a third person as an eternal dove roosting in heaven next to two thrones, although Trinitarian artwork displays this falsehood. The Holy Ghost is not a literal dove. He only appeared like a dove at Jesus' baptism as a sign for John the Baptist to identify the Lamb of God. The Holy Spirit changed its form from dove to 120 licks of fire in Acts chapter 2. At his baptism in Matthew 3, verse 15, Jesus said he must fulfill all righteousness, which has two meanings. First, he was setting the example of righteous obedience for New Testament believers to be baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, which was later preached by Peter in Acts 2, verse 38. Repentance is the prerequisite for water baptism, which is followed by the spiritual baptism of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' case, he didn't need repentance unto baptism like all believers need, but he did it as an example. However, Jesus did need to be filled with the Holy Spirit after his baptism. As scripture says, the Spirit descended from heaven and then abode, lived, and remained on him when he came up out of the water. Luke 4 verse 1 says Jesus left Jordan full of the Holy Ghost and was immediately led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Jesus was given the Spirit without measure and personally verified he received the baptism of the Spirit, saying, Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? God's righteous design is that filling or anointing comes after washing. Elijah's burnt sacrifice on Mount Carmel was first drenched with four barrels of water, and then the fire of God fell from heaven. Moses, Aaron, and his sons were commanded by God to wash in water before approaching God at the completion of the tabernacle in the wilderness, and afterwards the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Similarly, Jesus' temple of his body had to be washed before the Holy Ghost filled him. 
Second, Christ was baptized in order to fulfill the righteous Old Testament command for burnt offerings to be washed, according to Leviticus chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Burnt offerings were a sweet savor unto the Lord, and Paul says Jesus hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God, for a sweet-smelling savor. Jesus, being washed at his baptism, was later offered as God's perfect, complete, and acceptable burnt offering. Understanding Jesus' Prayers in Gethsemane Although Jesus prayed throughout his ministry, his Gethsemane prayers reveal his full humanity and help prove God's one personality. Jesus' prayers cannot prove God is three persons, because the supposed co-equal, co-eternal Son would not need to pray to another co-equal, co-eternal person, the Father. Three eternal persons is always equivalent to polytheism. Jesus' Gethsemane prayer shows Jesus was 100% human and 100% deity, yet this doesn't equal two co-equal gods. The human part of the Son had a separate will than the eternal Father, as Christ says, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Jesus' flesh, although sinless, did not want to die, but obediently surrendered to the will of the Father. Jesus' humanity needed God's deity, just as your humanity needs God's deity. The difference between Jesus and you is that Jesus' humanity had a word nature, while your humanity has a sin nature. Does the mention of two wills, Jesus' fleshly will and the Father's will, equal two separate persons? No, but it does teach that Jesus' body was a one-of-a-kind human manifestation. God was manifest in the flesh that had to have a separate will and pronoun in order to die for mankind since the immortal spirit God could never die. God didn't become a second person in the body of Jesus. He was the same person in another form. God in human form, manifest in the flesh. The Word became flesh. God became flesh. The Father and Son were one in nature, the Word, but with different characteristics. Other Threefold References Accompanying Matthew 28, verse 19, 1 John 5, verse 7, and Jesus' baptism are threefold references to the Godhead such as both Paul and John's epistle greetings and benedictions. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14, is a widely known example saying, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Do threefold references to the Godhead like this prove God as three persons? No, for these references never call God three persons. But they do prove how necessary it is for believers to recognize God's three manifestations. Recall that 1 John 5 verse 7 says the Father, Word, and Holy Ghost are heavenly witnesses for or against all mankind, proving the absolute necessity for believers to recognize God's three manifestations, including the one in which they live. For example, we are living in the age of the Holy Ghost manifestation, for the Son of Man is no longer on the earth and has ascended to the right hand of the Father. If we neglect or speak evil of the Holy Ghost today, there is no hope of forgiveness. For Christ says, But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. In Jesus' earthly ministry, he harshly warned the Pharisees to not reject his Son manifestation, saying, For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. The Pharisees could apparently accept God in the Father manifestation, but not God's current manifestation in the Son, and so condemnation awaited their unbelieving hearts. As you examine Paul and John's epistle greetings, you'll find their emphasis was on the Father and Son, and not upon worshiping three persons. Four examples of epistle greetings mention the Father and Son, but nothing of the Holy Ghost. Romans 1 verse 7, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 3, 1 John 1 verse 3, and 2 John 1 verse 3. Does this mean Paul believed in only two persons, so he left out the third person of the Trinity? No, it means it was not necessary to mention the Holy Ghost because Paul knew the Father and Holy Ghost are the selfsame person. Returning to scriptures with threefold references, it seems God allows this to help believers better understand the enigma of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 
In 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14, Paul mentions the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost. Although the three attributes all pertain to God, grace, love, communion, Paul uses each one separately to help believers appreciate each manifestation. For example, Paul said the grace of Christ would be with believers, which supports John's words that Christ was full of grace and truth. And by grace, Jesus tasted death for every man. Next, Paul emphasized the love of God. John 3, verse 16 and Romans 8, verses 38 and 39 explain God's great love that caused him to send his son to die for our salvation and speak of ten things that cannot separate us from the love of God. Third, Paul ends the verse by wisely pointing out the believer's current communion of the Holy Ghost. Christians today have communion with the Holy Ghost, who is the self-same person as the Father. God's plan was for the Son to have only about three and a half years of earthly communion with Jesus' disciples. Peter, James, John, and the rest of the apostles were privileged to commune with the Son face to face. But our lot is communion with Christ through the Comforter, the Holy Ghost, just as Jesus taught in John 14, verse 26, saying, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Is Jesus the Eternal Son? Some Trinitarians give Jesus the title Eternal Son, which probably originates from the Athanasian Creed. The Creed says, The Father is eternal, the Son is eternal, the Holy Spirit is eternal. But the Eternal Son title is both absent from the Bible and deceiving, because it alludes to Jesus and the Father eternally existing as two separate persons in heaven. The truth is Jesus' human body did not exist until God's Spirit formed it in Mary's womb. Christ's body had a beginning, but his spirit or nature, the Word, did not. Jesus was and always will be the Word, God's nature, but Christ is not a separate person from God. The Eternal Son title is self-contradictory because the word Son automatically suggests a beginning point. Branham says, People talk about Jesus being the Eternal Son of God. Now isn't that a contradiction? Whoever heard of a Son being eternal? Sons have beginnings, but that which is eternal never had a beginning. He is the eternal God, Jehovah, manifested in the flesh. The implication of the eternal Son dwelling with the eternal Father and eternal Spirit is the declaration of three gods, which is easily detected in today's influential pastors. With all due respect to Rick Warren, whose Purpose Driven Life book contains many truths, it also contains false Trinitarian teachings. The first misunderstanding is Warren saying God invites us to enjoy friendship and fellowship with all three persons of the Trinity. This falsehood is nowhere found in Scripture, but the opposite is true. The prophets Isaiah, Ezekiel, and John, the Revelator, had fellowship with only one person in their heavenly visions. No Bible passage ever teaches believers to have present or future fellowship with three separate persons. Thankfully, Christians do not have the pressure of giving equal fellowship with three separate persons. Another error is Warren teaching the Trinity is God's relationship to himself. It's the perfect pattern for relational harmony, and we should study its implications. God has always existed in loving relationship to himself, so he has never been lonely. He didn't need a family. It's true that God has never been lonely, as Paul says God does not need anything in Acts 17, verse 25. The book of Isaiah states the Lord, who has no equal, made all things alone by himself, proving creation was done by one person, not three. It's incorrect to say God has a relationship to himself, which means he has relationships with two other Trinity members. The implication of a three-person God having a relationship to himself is God managing a multiple personalities disorder. God is one person, with no co-equal persons existing beside him. God does not have to balance three personalities. The truth is that God does have relationship with his manifested thoughts. God is the only one in the universe that has this power and privilege. As the omnipotent, eternal, ever-invisible holy God, he dwelt alone with his thoughts inside his being well before he created angels and the universe. 
God wasn't having relationship with his thoughts because they needed to be expressed as individual persons before that could occur. Every Christian is a manifested thought of God. As 2 Corinthians 6 verse 16 teaches, God expressed believers to be temples of his. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You were previously an eternal thought of God, and now that you're expressed in a flesh body, God can come and live and walk in you. God fellowships with you by living inside you. Before God created humans, he did have a relationship with his son, the Logos, but not as a separate person. Jesus confirms this twice in John 17, saying, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was, and for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. This doesn't mean God is two persons, but it shows Jesus' spiritual body was God's first creation, since Jesus says he is the beginning of the creation of God. Before earth and humans were created, a celestial body or spirit body came out of the invisible God. Scholars call this body the Logos, which is the Greek word for word in John 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In other words, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and was God's visible image. The Logos is the Holy Spirit, only visible. This visible Logos was moved by the invisible Spirit hiding inside it, proving the Logos is not a second person, but the image of God's one person. This Logos is personified as wisdom in Proverbs 8, verse 12, and verses 22 through 31. Listen to this loving description of the Father and Son, the Logos. I dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth. When he established the clouds above. When he strengthened the fountains of the deep. When he gave to the sea his decree, that the water should not pass his commandment. When he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. This is the glory of Jesus' relationship with his Father before the world was in John 17, verse 5. It's undeniable that eternal life is in the Son, Jesus Christ. While Jesus is not the eternal Son, he does have eternal life. 1 John 5, verses 11 and 12, mentions this fact twice, saying, God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. The conclusion is that God's eternal life is in the Son, because the invisible God created Jesus' body and forever dwells inside it. The Rewards for Receiving the Revelation of the Godhead There are at least three rewards for receiving the revelation of the Godhead. The first is that you will know God intimately as He wants to be known, enjoying true fellowship with the Almighty. Monotheism is true intimate worship. The ancient Hebrews were strict monotheists, so much so that Jesus told the Samaritan woman at the well that Jews know what they worship. Jews were not guessing God was one person. They knew God was one person. It is only through monotheism that you can be a true, intimate worshiper. Jesus says the Father is currently seeking true worshipers. Worshiping God as three persons is false worship, proven by the fact that many Trinitarians sprinkle, instead of fully immerse at baptism, call upon God's titles rather than His one name, and bless themselves with the sign of the cross and holy water. As you worship God's one personality, you are like Abel bringing the correct, acceptable sacrifice. False worshippers bring sacrifices of their own choosing, like Cain. When you worship God as one person, the Lord grants you true communion with himself.
You don't have to worry about communing equally with each person of the Trinity. You don't have to wonder why you feel like you know the Father and Son so well, but feel distant from the Holy Spirit. 1 John 1 verse 3 says, Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. When you believe on Jesus Christ, receiving the Son's work on Calvary, He reveals the Father, and the Father is the Holy Spirit. Matthew 11 verse 27 declares, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. An example of this blessed communion is in daily prayer, because God's three manifestations are active. The Holy Spirit anoints and leads Christians to have access in prayer to the Father, invisible spirit, through the Son. As Ephesians 2 verse 18 tells us, we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Christians come boldly to speak to the Father, but it can be only done through the great High Priest, Jesus the Son of God. Jesus' human body is the invisible Father's heavenly representation. The second reward for receiving the true revelation of the Godhead is possessing God's overcoming power. Jesus promised this power to Peter, saying, The gates of hell shall not prevail against it, it being the revelation that Jesus was the Christ. Was Jesus' promise to Peter true? Yes. Did hell's counsel prevail against Peter? No, for even in Peter's greatest failure, publicly denying Christ three times before Jesus' crucifixion, Jesus personally showed himself alive to Peter before the rest of the apostles after his resurrection. Hell's counsels will not prevail against you even in the midst of your greatest failures because you have the same revelation about Jesus as Peter. Paul lists 17 sins that you'll overcome. There could be more elsewhere in Scripture. By the Spirit of God in 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 and 10 and Galatians 5 verses 19 through 21. Idolatry effeminate, child molestation, abusers of themselves with mankind, homosexuality, covetousness, drunkards, revilers, uncleanness, lasciviousness, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, and revelings. Knowing Jesus Christ in truth with true revelation gives you power to overcome every device of hell. The third reward for receiving the Godhead revelation is the future reward of knowing Jesus' new name, which he will share with you. God is pleased that during your life you have confessed the name of the Lord Jesus Christ before family, friends, and associates. Like the church in Philadelphia, you have not denied Jesus' holy name. Since you confess Christ's name in life, Christ will confess your name before the Father and then share his new name with you, the Overcomer. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Branham writes, When all becomes new, then he will take upon him a new name, and that name will be the name of the bride also. What that name is? None dare conjecture. It would have to be a revelation of the Spirit given so conclusively that none would dare deny it. But no doubt he will leave that revelation to the day when he desires to give that name forth. Suffice it to know that it will be more wonderful than we could ever imagine. The Consequences for Rejecting the Revelation of the Godhead There are four possible consequences for rejecting the revelation of the Godhead. Let me state that these consequences do not refer to all Trinitarians, but certainly most, because Jesus said few would find the narrow road of truth. First, many who reject God as one person and maintain He is three persons, without literal Bible evidence, will be guilty of idolatry, breaking the first commandment, lying by adding to God's pure words, and blaspheming God's name. The first commandment says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. But it's also apparent in this verse that God wants no other gods with him. Isaiah records God saying six times, There is no one else beside me, and twice says he has no equal. Yet the Trinity fabricates two other equal persons beside God the Father, just as ancient religions concocted a triad of divine persons. 
the devil has succeeded in making idolaters out of the masses through their complete ignorance and rejection of Scripture. Satan's trinity deception has made many Trinitarians liars in God's sight. For anyone who willingly adds to Scripture will be called such, as previously referenced in Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. The Antichrist spirit is leading sinners to blaspheme God's name by substituting the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in the place of the all-powerful name, the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ's name is denied when baptizing, casting out devils, and performing miracles, Satan has succeeded in blasphemy God's name. A second long-term effect of rejecting the Godhead revelation is a slow spiritual death as taught in James 1 verse 15, for sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. In fact, any false doctrine can have this effect, as Paul points out that the false doctrine that says the resurrection or rapture has already happened slowly overthrows the faith of some, spreading like a canker over their spiritual lives. A canker in the Greek is gangrene, the slow flesh and bone eating disease. One false belief can cause a person to increase unto more ungodliness, for accepting a second lie is easier than accepting the first. Jesus uses a similar illustration for false doctrine, calling it leaven, which also slowly spreads until all the dough is leavened. If the false trinity doctrine is accepted in a church, it's much easier for the rest of the church's teaching to become corrupted. You can easily apply the gangrene or leaven effect to today's churches. Most church leaders allow their members to be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. The following sins are more widely accepted than ever, despite being plainly identified as evil in Scripture. Adultery, being married to someone other than your first spouse while your first spouse is still alive. Fornication, having sexual relations before marriage. Homosexuality, drunkenness, cursing, watching sinful movies, listening to sinful music, cross-dressing, immodest clothes, women cutting their hair, lying, stealing, and the like. A third consequence is a greater likelihood of being given the status of a foolish Christian rather than wise, as taught by Christ in Matthew 25, verses 1 through 12. Chapter 6 and 8 contain a lengthy teaching on wise and foolish virgins. Our Lord says there are two kinds of Christians, wise and foolish. It's possible for a foolish Christian to be saved and go to heaven despite having made foolish decisions in his life in regards to the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and in this case, the Godhead. Trinitarians can still be saved, although it's foolish to add to the Bible, calling God three persons when he never reveals himself thus. Jesus told his own followers they were fools for not believing all that the prophets had spoken regarding his coming. The same is true today because scholars and doctors of divinity will not believe God's prophets, like Isaiah, who repeatedly declare that God is one and there is none beside him. Because the foolish virgins failed to get the oil or baptism of the Holy Ghost, they could not be led by the Spirit into all truth and thus continue to confess that God was three persons. A fourth and final consequence is not knowing and ignorantly worshiping God. On Mars Hill, Paul met Athenians who were ignorantly worshiping an unknown God. A friend once shared her frustration with feeling well acquainted with the Father and Son, yet felt the Holy Spirit was a stranger. Sadly, my friend had attended church for over 30 years, and in the current Holy Spirit dispensation, the Old Testament fatherhood and sonship dispensations have already passed, admitted to not even knowing the Holy Spirit. If my friend was sincerely yet ignorantly trying to worship the third person of the Trinity after 30 years, how likely is it that many other lifelong Trinitarian church members feel like they do not know God or one of his persons? Furthermore, do Trinitarians always know to which person of the Trinity they are praying? Like the Pharisees, many Trinitarians today do not know Jesus because God's word doesn't have a place in their hearts and minds. Trinitarians often reject the plain, simple witness of Scripture in order to add three persons to the Bible. Conclusion Although one mysterious element remains about the Godhead, God has revealed Himself as one person who manifests Himself in three ways to redeem mankind. All dark, shadowy confusion about God's number of persons scatters in the light of Bible witnesses, revealing one immortal, invisible, eternal person the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus Christ is supreme deity. Jesus Christ is God. Theologians, scholars, historians, and preachers all admit 
that the doctrine of three persons is not implicitly taught in Scripture, and there are at least eight Bible-backed reasons why the Trinity doctrine is wrong. Indeed, God never called himself three persons. A three-person God automatically injects tritheism into Christianity, expressly seen through Jesus, supposedly having two fathers and being filled with two other co-equal persons. What better way for Satan to blaspheme God's name than to change it to titles, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and then convince billions of Trinitarians to deny the power in the name of Jesus Christ? Ultimately, accepting the Trinity will likely lead to long-term spiritual sickness in churches who embrace it because any doctrinal lie spreads like gangrene or leaven. Accepting the revelation of the Godhead brings intimacy with Christ, overcoming power against the gates of hell, and a promise to share in Jesus' new name in the New Jerusalem. With this life-giving, prevailing Godhead revelation, you can now move on to the second mystery relating to God's blinding of his Old Testament people Israel and understand why most cannot see Jesus is the Messiah. Action Steps Number 1. If you're a former Trinitarian, repent of purposely or ignorantly adding to God's known character. Rejoice in knowing God in truth as one divine person. Step 2. Although the revelation of the Godhead isn't required for salvation, be ready to share God's true revelation with others by citing Scripture alone, while explaining the danger of adding three persons to God's character. Step 3. Be aware to avoid lots of Trinitarian references in songs, for example, holy, 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 statements of faith, and wedding or baptismal blessings. Step 4. Be careful when associating with Trinitarians for the fact that one false doctrine often leads to many others.